Welcome to the next chapter, it is transport in animals. Animals need a continuous supply of food, nutrients and oxygen to be able to carry out life processes. These processes include growth, repair, maintenance, movement and so on. The materials are of course obtained from outside the body via ingestion. These nutrients are broken down during metabolism to release energy and in the process waste materials are produced. Again the animal need a continuous removal of these waste materials to avoid their build up in the body because some of them are actually toxic like ammonia. This exchange of materials is achieved through a transport system. Different organisms in the kingdom Animalia have different transport systems and mechanisms that serve this purpose. Some are simple, some of them are very complex. In this chapter we look at these transport systems ranging from the simple diffusion in unicellular organisms to the elaborate and complex systems in mammals. Single cell animals, for example amoeba and tapeworm, carry out the exchange of gases and nutrients through the entire body surface by simple diffusion. And the reason for this is because unicellular organisms have a large surface area to volume ratio. On the other hand, multicellular organisms like mammals have a small surface area to volume ratio. Most of the cells of multicellular organisms are way far from the external surface of the body. These cells cannot obtain all the body requirements by diffusion alone, which is often a slow process. Therefore, multicellular organisms need an elaborate transport system. The elaborate transport system is made up of body cavities and or a network of vessels such as arteries and veins. In other words, an elaborate transport system has features outlined here. First of all, it has an increased surface area at the sites of exchange of materials. Such sites include the lungs and gills where oxygen is absorbed and villi where food nutrients are absorbed along the alimentary canal. Secondly, it is a system whereby the circulating medium carries the absorbed substances at a faster rate than diffusion. Transport in microorganisms. Transport in microorganisms such as amoeba is through simple diffusion. An amoeba has a large surface area to volume ratio. When the oxygen is at a higher concentration in the surrounding medium than inside the body of an amoeba, oxygen diffuses into the body through the entire body surface. The oxygen is utilized in the body for respiration, which produces carbon four oxide. Again, when carbon four oxide and nitrogenous waste are at higher concentration inside the body of the amoeba than outside the surrounding medium, the carbon dioxide and nitrogenous waste diffuse from the body into the surrounding medium through the entire body surface, again through simple diffusion. Circulatory system of multicellular organisms. In multicellular organisms, most cells are far deep seated away from the body surface and diffusion cannot achieve the role of exchange of materials. Multicellular organisms need an elaborate transport system to bring the molecules of oxygen and nutrients close enough to the cells for diffusion to occur. A circulatory system is made up of a fluid, a pumping organ, and vessels. There are two types of circulatory system, the open and the closed circulatory system. Open circulatory system. In this system, the fluid is pumped and flows through the body cavities. The fluid is contained in body cavities called synapses. Cavities are free spaces between the body walls and organs. There are ventral and dorsal cavities, and the fluid in the cavities is in contact with body tissues. The fluid distributes nutrients and hormones to the tissues while removing carbon-4 oxide and nitrogenous waste from the tissues. 
Members of the phylum Arthropoda have an open circulatory system. So if we could look at the circulatory system of the cockroach, the circulatory system is an open one and blood flows in body spaces called synapses in the body cavities. The system consists of blood, heart, synapses and alary muscles. The blood is white in color because it lacks hemoglobin and does not transport the respiratory gases. It however transports nutrients to all body cells and collects waste materials and delivers them to the excretory organs called the Malpighian tubules. Body cavity is divided into three chambers or synapses. The dorsal synapse is also called the pericardial synapse. The heart is present here. The middle synapse consists of visceral organs and is called the perivisceral synapse. The ventral synapse is called the perineural synapse. It surrounds the ventral nerve. The heart is in the pericardial synapse and consists of 13 chambers. Blood flows from the posterior chamber to the anterior. The heart has lateral pores called the ostia which open into the pericardial synapse. The very anterior chamber opens into an aorta. Perivisceral synapse collect blood from the head synapse. Alary muscles are triangular shaped. Their contraction and relaxation force the blood into the heart. When the alary muscles contract, blood flows from the perivisceral and perineural synapses into the pericardial synapse. When the muscles relax, blood flows from the pericardial sinus into the heart via the ostia. The contraction of the heart moves the blood from the posterior to the anterior chambers. Blood moves from all the chambers out through the aorta into the head sinus and again into the perivisceral and perineural sinuses, and the cycle repeats itself once again. The blood is colorless and does not transport respiratory gases. It however transports nutrients and waste materials. The same circulation is seen in other insects like grasshopper. The dorsal vessel runs the length of the body and is divided into a posterior heart with ostia and an anterior aorta. The open space is called a hemocell. It is filled with blood which is called the hemolymph. Again the hemolymph does not transport the respiratory gases and thus has no hemoglobin, thus it lacks the red color. The blood is pumped by the heart through the aorta into the head and flows back into the body through the hemocell. It enters the heart through ostia and the cycle repeats once again. Closed circulatory system. In a closed circulatory system, there is a pumping organ called the heart, a fluid such as blood and blood vessels, namely the arteries and veins. The closed circulatory system is found in invertebrates such as earthworm and invertebrates such as humans. The blood is pumped by a muscular heart into arteries which divide to form smaller arterioles. The arterioles branch further to form capillaries. The capillaries form a dense network in the body organs and tissues. The dense network of capillaries allows for exchange of materials between the blood and the body by diffusion. 
capillaries join to form venules which join further to form veins. Veins return blood to the heart. The closed circulatory system can either be single or double. Single circulatory system. In single circulatory system, the blood passes the heart once in a single complete circulation. Blood passes through two capillary systems before flowing back to the heart. In this circulatory system, the heart has one auricle or atrium and a ventricle. Valves are found at the entrance into the atrium and between the atrium and the ventricle. The valve at the entrance into the atrium allows blood to flow into the atrium and closes when the atrium contracts. The closure prevents backflow of blood. It ensures blood flows in one direction into the ventricle. The valve between the auricle and ventricle opens to allow blood to flow into the relaxed ventricle. This valve closes when blood attempts to flow back into the relaxed auricle and this ensures that blood flows into the ventral aorta. The single circulatory system is found in earthworms and fish. In an earthworm, the circulatory system is a closed one as the blood flows through blood vessels. The system consists of blood, vessels, and heart. The blood is red in color due to presence of hemoglobin dissolved in plasma. Blood vessels are closed tubes connected to the heart. There are two of them, the dorsal and the ventral blood vessels. The dorsal blood vessel acts as a collecting blood vessel. It collects blood from different organs by three pairs of vessels in each segment. Each vessel collects the blood from the skin, nephridia, and the intestines. Therefore, it acts as the chief vein. Ventral vessel act as a distributing vessel, distributing the blood to the skin, nephridia, and the intestines again by three pairs of blood vessels in each segment. It is there for the chief artery. Eight pairs of heart are present in the 13 to 16 segments. They connect the dorsal and the ventral blood vessels. The dorsal vessel collects blood from all organs. The blood passes from the anterior to the posterior end in the dorsal blood vessel and enters the ventral blood vessel, supplying blood to all organs. Blood passes from the posterior to the anterior in the ventral blood vessel. On the other hand, in fish, the blood is pumped by a muscular ventricle through the ventral aorta into the gill capillaries for gaseous exchange. The oxygenated blood in capillaries drains into the dorsal aorta. The dorsal aorta branches into smaller vessels which distribute the blood to various parts of the body. By the time the blood reaches the capillaries within the tissues, the pressure is low. The pressure of blood reduces as blood flows through the tissues and organs. From the body, the blood is drained by small veins which empty the blood into the auricle. The blood flows back to the heart under low pressure. The Double Circulatory System now, in the double circulatory system, blood passes through the heart with complete circulation. In this system, the heart has two auricles and two ventricles. Valves are found in between the auricles and ventricles and also at the exit of the aorta and the pulmonary artery from the heart. The double circulatory system is found in birds and mammals. Crocodiles, which are reptiles, have a double circulatory system. The other reptiles and amphibians have double circulatory systems but the ventricle is not fully divided into the right and left ventricles. Therefore, the efficiency of gaseous exchange is not fully realized. Why? Due to the mixing of oxygenated and deoxygenated blood. Circulatory system in humans. 
The circulatory system in humans and mammals at large is a close double circulation. It consists of the heart, blood, and blood vessels. The external structure of the heart. The mammalian heart is broad at the anterior and narrower at the posterior end. The coronary artery which branches from the aorta supplies oxygen and nutrients to the heart tissues. The two coronary veins transport carbon four oxide and metabolic waste away from the heart. The heart is covered by a translucent membrane called the pericardium. The pericardium prevents the heart from being overstretched as it pumps blood. The pericardium secretes pericardial fluid and the fluid reduces friction between the heart and the adjacent tissues when the heart beats. At the anterior end of the heart are vessels. The aorta and pulmonary artery take blood away from the heart and the vena cava and pulmonary vein return blood to the heart from the rest of the body. Internally, a longitudinal section of the heart reveals two auricles and two ventricles, blood vessels and a muscular wall and valve as shown on your screen. The heart is made up of specialized muscles called the cardiac muscles. The cardiac muscles are able to contract and relax continuously throughout one's lifetime without fatigue. The contraction and relaxation originate from within the muscles. Cardiac muscles are said to be myogenic. The walls of the auricles and atria are thinner than those of the ventricles. Auricles pump blood to ventricles while ventricles pump blood to the lower parts of the body. Blood flows from auricles to ventricles through valves. The valves open to allow blood flow in one direction only. They close when the blood tries to flow back. Valves are attached to the walls of the ventricles by valve tendons or tendinous cords. The tendons allow the valves to open but prevent inversion of the flaps of the valves when the blood attempts to flow back. The valve between the right auricle and the right ventricle is known as the tricuspid valve. This valve has three flaps, thus the prefix tri. The valve between the left auricle and the ventricle is known as the bicuspid valve because it has two flaps. The semilunar valves at the base of the aorta and the pulmonary artery prevent backflow of blood into the left and right ventricles, respectively, when they relax. The left and the right side of the heart are separated by a thick muscular wall called the septum. The muscular wall of the left ventricle has thicker muscles than that of the right ventricle. The left ventricle pumps blood a further distance to all parts of the body while the right ventricle pumps blood to the lungs. Blood flow through the heart. Deoxygenated blood from all parts of the body is brought to the right auricle by the vena cava. The inferior vena cava brings blood from the lower part of the body, while the superior vena cava brings deoxygenated blood from the upper part of the body. The inferior and superior vena cava join to form the vena cava. Deoxygenated blood enters the heart through the right atrium. The muscles of the right atrium relax. Its volume increases while pressure decreases. The right auricle fills up with deoxygenated blood. Pressure in the right auricle increases and muscles contract to force the blood through the tricuspid valve into the right ventricle. The right ventricle muscles relax and the volume of the ventricle increases. Blood pushes into the ventricle and fills up. Pressure in the right ventricle increases and it contracts. The tricuspid valve closes when blood tries to flow back into the now relaxed right auricle. At the same time, the semilunar valve in the pulmonary artery opens. The open semilunar valve allows blood to flow through the pulmonary artery into the lungs. The right ventricle relaxes. The semilunar valve closes when blood tries to flow back into the relaxed right ventricle. In the lungs, the deoxygenated blood absorbs more oxygen and thus becomes oxygenated. 
the oxygenated blood returns through the pulmonary vein to the left auricle. The volume of the auricle increases while pressure decreases. The left auricle fills up with blood. When the left auricle is full, the pressure builds up. The pressure causes the muscles of the left auricle to contract, forcing the blood to flow into the left ventricle through the bicuspid valve. The left ventricle contracts. The semilunar valve in the outer opens and blood flows to the tissues of the body through the outer. Now notice that both the left and right auricles relax and contract at the same time. Similarly, the right and left ventricles relax and contract at the same time. When the auricles relax, the ventricles contract and vice versa. Now here are some of the ways in which the mammalian heart is adapted to its function. First of all, the heart has valves which open to allow blood to flow only in one direction and closes when blood tries to flow back. It has muscular walls which contract to pump blood and ensure its continuous flow. It also has a septum which separates oxygenated from deoxygenated blood. It has an inbuilt system that controls contraction and relaxation of the muscles. The heart has four chambers which store blood briefly before it is pumped to the rest of the body and its muscles contract and relax continuously without fatigue. Now the heartbeat. The heartbeat is felt as a pulse which is a series of waves of dilation that pass along the arteries caused by pressure of blood pumped from the heart through contractions of the left ventricle. The heartbeat takes place in a series of steps. First, the auricles contract while the ventricles relax. Next, the ventricles contract while the auricles relax. The ventricles then relax and the cycle is complete. A complete cycle of a heartbeat takes less than one second. The human heart beats approximately about 72 times per minute during rest but the heartbeat can increase up to 200 times per minute during exercise, fever or emotional disturbances. Now every time the heart beats, the atria and ventricles relax and contract in coordination and this coordinated beating is accomplished by a number of tissues. First, the sinoarterial node contains pacemaker cells that generate an electrical pulse. Conducting cells relay the signal to the muscle tissues of the right and left atria to stimulate contraction. They also send a signal to the atrioventricular node or the AV node which slows down the relay of signal to the ventricles. After the delay, the signal is sent to the atrioventricular bundles which stimulate contraction of the ventricles. Now this delay is critical to allow the atria adequate time to contract down the blood they contain and force open the AV valve before the ventricles contract. One heartbeat consists of a systole and a diastole phase. The systole beat occurs when the ventricles contract while the diastole beat occurs when the ventricles relax. The effect of the heartbeat can be felt in other parts of the body, especially where large arteries lie against a bone. The heartbeat can be felt as a pulse in various parts of the body where an artery is close to the skin surface such as the wrist. Let's start with diastole. A diastole refers to the phase when ventricles relax in order to allow blood to flow in. Now during this phase, the ventricular volume increases and the pressure decreases. When the right auricle contracts, the tricuspid valve opens to allow deoxygenated blood to flow from the right auricle into the right ventricle. At the same time, the left auricle contracts and the bicuspid valve opens to allow oxygenated blood to flow into the left ventricle. The semilunar valves close to prevent blood from flowing back into the relaxed ventricles. The pressure of the pulmonary artery drops to 8 mm of mercury, while that of the outer drops to 80 mm of mercury. In systole, systole refers to the phase when the ventricles contract to force blood into the arteries while auricles relax. 
When the left ventricle muscles contract, the bicuspid valves close to prevent blood from flowing back into the relaxed auricles. When the muscles of the right ventricle contract, the tricuspid valves close to prevent the backflow of blood into the relaxed auricle. Now, during systole beat, the volume of the ventricles decreases while pressure increases, forcing blood to flow out of the heart. Deoxygenated blood flows through the semilunar valve through the pulmonary artery to the lungs, while oxygenated blood flows through the semilunar valve of the aorta and into the tissues of the body. The contraction of the ventricles develops a pressure which is felt in the arteries and the left ventricle develops a pressure of about 120 millimeters of mercury to push blood to all tissues of the body through the aorta. The right ventricle develops a pressure of around 25 millimeters of mercury to push blood into the lungs through the pulmonary artery. The sigma manometer is used for measuring blood pressure. Blood pressure is obtained by placing the systole pressure of the left ventricle over the diastole pressure of the left ventricle. When a medical professional takes your blood pressure, they can find out how well your circulatory system is working. Blood pressure is measured using a sphygmomanometer. The cuff is inflated to a pressure well above the systolic pressure, blocking the flow within the arteries. As the pressure of the cuff is slowly released, blood begins to flow through during the contraction of the ventricle. At this point, the cuff pressure equals the systolic pressure. As the pressure is released, it reaches a point where it doesn't disrupt blood flow, and the reading at this point is diastolic pressure. The normal pressure for a human being is a systolic of 120 millimeters of mercury and a diastolic of 80 millimeters of mercury. Any pressure above these values is considered too high. Next is blood vessels, and the mammalian blood vessels are the arteries, veins, and capillaries. The arteries take blood from the heart to the body tissues and organs. The arteries are thick-walled, muscular, and elastic. The diameter of the lumen of an artery appears narrow due to thickness of the walls, and the innermost layer of cells of an artery are called the endothelium. The endothelium is made up of one layer of cells which is delicate and has elastic fibers. It offers the least resistance to blood flow. The muscular walls of the artery resist the high pressure with which the heart pumps the blood. The muscular layer is made up of smooth muscles and elastic fibers. The smooth muscles are arranged in circles in the walls. The elastic fibers and the smooth muscles make the contraction and relaxation for the efficient movement of blood. The outermost layer is made up of connective elements such as collagen fibers. The connective elements run parallel to the long axis of the vessel. Arteries often occur deep in the muscles for protection against injury. Next are the veins, and veins return blood to the heart. Blood in veins flows smoothly under low pressure. Veins are valves at regular intervals to maintain the undirectional flow of blood. Veins have a wider lumen than the arteries, and the walls of the veins are less muscular than those of the arteries. The walls are less muscular and elastic, and thus veins offer minimum resistance to blood flow. Most veins are found between the skeletal muscles and may be visible. The skeletal muscles contract squeezing veins and forcing blood to flow towards the heart. Next are the capillaries. And capillaries are narrow blood vessels whose walls are one cell thick. The cells are elongated running longitudinally along the vessel. There are many capillaries in the human body and the intensity of metabolism determines the density of the capillary network in the tissues and body organs. There is a dense network of blood capillaries in the lungs, liver, kidney, glands, skeletal muscles and grey matter of the brain. Capillaries are in direct contact with tissues 
and the exchange of materials between the blood and cells occur through the capillary wall by diffusion. The capillary wall is one cell thick offering the least resistance for exchange of substances. The pumping mechanism of the heart causes hydrostatic pressure in the capillaries. The high hydrostatic pressure causes substances that have small molecules to pass through the capillary wall. The thin wall also offers little resistance to the passage of small molecules into the space between the blood vessels and the cells. The walls of the capillaries are said to be permeable, that is, they allow the passage of molecules through them. A fluid is formed which is referred to as tissue fluid and the cells obtain their requirements through diffusion from the tissue fluid. The substances that leave the capillaries include glucose, water, minerals and hormones. The cells are bathed by the tissue fluid. They release waste products of their metabolic activity into the fluid. Substances released into the fluid would include nitrogenous waste, mineral salts, carbon four oxide and heat. These substances that have resulted from body metabolism diffuse into the blood within the capillaries. Note that blood is also involved in the distribution of body heat which results from metabolic reactions in the body. The hydrostatic pressure decreases towards the capillaries. The capillaries unite to form venules which unite further to form veins. The lower pressure allows for re-entry of some of the fluid back into the capillaries. Dissolved substances in the fluid enter the circulatory system. The actual substances exchanged depend on the organ being supplied with the oxygenated blood. Capillaries also form a dense network for efficient diffusion of substances. Carbon four oxide and excretory products diffuse from the cells into the blood in the capillaries. White blood cells can also squeeze out of capillaries at infection sites. Blood vessels like all tissues are provided with all their requirements through the blood. Now the last component of the circulatory system is the blood and blood is a specialized type of connective tissue. On average, a human body has approximately five and a half liters of blood. The blood has a pH of around 7.4. Blood consists of blood cells suspended in a fluid medium called plasma. The components of the blood are red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets. Platelets are cell fragments found within the plasma. And we start with the red blood cells. The red blood cells are also called erythrocytes. Red blood cells are produced in the bone marrow of ribs, sternum, and the vertebrae. In an embryo, the red blood cells are produced in liver and the spleen. The red blood cells are highly differentiated and specialized for oxygen transport. Red blood cells are biconcave in shape and do not have a nucleus. The cells also lack other organelles such as centrioles and mitochondria. However, all vertebrates except mammals have red blood cells which have nucleus. The biconcave shape increases the surface area over which oxygen and carbon dioxide diffuse for transportation. The absence of the nucleus increases the space in which hemoglobin is packed. Hemoglobin is a chemical pigment which is red in color. Hemoglobin has high affinity for oxygen. There are approximately 5.5 million red blood cells in one milliliter of blood. The large number of red blood cells and the large surface area increases the total surface area over which gaseous exchange takes place. The lifespan of a red blood cell is approximately 120 days after which it is destroyed in the spleen. The iron component of hemoglobin is released for formation of new red blood cells while the rest of the material is taken to the liver where it is broken down. Red blood cells function to transport oxygen and carbon for oxide. Next, white blood cells. White blood cells are also referred to as leukocytes and white blood cells have a large nucleus but no pigment and hence their cytoplasm appears colorless. The cells are irregular in shape and white blood cells squeeze out of walls of capillaries into intercellular spaces 
at the site of injury. There are about 4,000 to 13,000 white blood cells per cubic milliliter of blood. Thus, there are less white blood cells than red blood cells per cubic milliliter of blood. Children have more white blood cells per cubic milliliter than adults. The number of white blood cells, however, increases during and after infection. White blood cells are formed in the bone marrow of long bones such as femur and humerus. They are also formed in the lymph nodes. White blood cells protect the body against infection by protozoans, bacteria, and viruses. There are two types of leukocytes or white blood cells, namely granulocytes and agranulocytes. Granulocytes are also referred to as polymorphs. The name originates from the fact that they contain granules in their cytoplasm. Granulocytes have lobe-shaped nucleus. They are named according to the shape of the nucleus. Neutrophils and gap and destroy pathogens in the blood and tissues by a process called phagocytosis. Eosinophils produce antihistamine in people with allergic reactions such as asthma. Basophils produce an anti-clotting protein and histamine in damaged tissues. Agranulocytes. Agranulocytes have a prominent nucleus, no granules in the cytoplasm, and the cytoplasm is homogeneous. They are of two types. There are two types of agranulocytes, that is monocytes and lymphocytes. Monocytes are formed in the bone marrow. Monocytes destroy microorganisms such as bacteria by engulfing them. Lymphocytes, on the other hand, are manufactured or made in the bone marrow, lymph nodes, and the spleen. Lymphocytes have a thin layer of cytoplasm. They protect the body by producing a variety of antibodies, and antibodies function as antitoxins, agglutinins, opsonins, and lysines. Antitoxins neutralize toxins such as antigen produced by pathogens. Agglutinins cause clumping together of microorganisms. Such microorganisms cannot multiply and eventually die. Agglutinins also digest microorganisms by phagocytosis. Opsonins adhere to the outer surface of microorganisms. Thereafter, the phagocytes ingest the microorganisms. Opsonins are only produced during infection. They disintegrate when a person recovers. Lysines destroy microorganisms by digesting their cell membranes or cell walls. Platelets Platelets are also referred to as thrombocytes. They are made in the bone marrow and they are approximately 250,000 platelets per cubic milliliter of blood. Platelets produce an enzyme called thromboplastin, which plays a key role in blood clotting. When blood vessels are damaged, platelets are exposed to air. The damaged blood vessels or tissues have rough surfaces which trigger the platelets to release thromboplastin, also called thrombokinase. Thromboplastin initiates the process of blood clotting by neutralizing the anticoagulant factor known as heparin, which occurs naturally in blood. Thromboplastin activates conversion of prothrombin to thrombin in the presence of calcium ions. Vitamin K is required in the formation of prothrombin. Thrombin activates the conversion of soluble fibrinogen, which is an inactive protein, to insoluble fibrin. Fibrin forms a network of fibers which form a clot at the damaged surface. The scrub formed by the clot stops the loss of blood through bleeding. It also protects damaged tissues from being invaded by microorganisms by protecting a physical barrier. In humans, some individuals lack clotting factors and a condition called hemophilia results. It arises due to genetic disorder or due to lack of vitamin K or any of the clotting factors. Such individuals bleed excessively even for minor cuts which can be fatal. Injections containing vitamin K are given to prevent excessive bleeding. The chart shown here is known as the blood clotting cascade. The remaining component of blood is the plasma, and plasma is a pale yellow fluid comprising 92% of water and 8% dissolved substances. 
The dissolved substances include mineral ions such as chlorides and phosphates, proteins such as albumin, globulin, fibrinogen, food nutrients such as glucose, amino acids, vitamins and others, metabolic waste such as urea, ammonia, uric acid, carbon dioxide, and also dissolved gases such as oxygen. When fibrinogen is removed from blood plasma, we form what we call a serum. Serum is a clear yellow fluid. Transport of gases by blood. Blood transports oxygen and carbon for oxide. Transport of oxygen. Transport of oxygen is carried out by molecules contained in the red blood cells called hemoglobin. Hemoglobin readily combines with oxygen in the lungs to form oxyhemoglobin. Oxyhemoglobin is an unstable compound which readily releases oxygen to tissues under low oxygen concentration. The freed hemoglobin then readily combines with oxygen in the lungs under high oxygen concentration. In the tissues, oxygen diffuses out of the red blood cells through the capillary walls into the cells of tissues. Red blood cells are elastic and have the ability to change shape. They can squeeze and fit in the narrow blood capillary. The number of red blood cells in the human body vary depending on the oxygen concentration in the atmosphere. Under low oxygen concentration, like in high altitude areas, the bone marrow produces more red blood cells. When one moves from a low to a high altitude area, more red blood cells are manufactured to increase the oxygen carrying capacity of blood. Therefore, the total area over which gaseous exchange takes place is increased. In this way, one becomes acclimatized to the high altitude. At low altitude, there is more oxygen in the atmosphere and therefore less red blood cells are manufactured. Myoglobin is a pigment found in the muscles and myoglobin has a higher affinity for oxygen than hemoglobin and thus hemoglobin readily releases oxygen to myoglobin. Myoglobin releases oxygen to the cells in the muscles. Hemoglobin found in fetus is called fetal hemoglobin and this hemoglobin has a higher affinity for oxygen than the mother's hemoglobin. This enables the fetal hemoglobin to obtain enough oxygen from the mother's blood even at low oxygen concentration. After birth, the red blood cells containing fetal hemoglobin are destroyed in large numbers. New red blood cells are formed. The large number of red blood cells destroyed cause a lot of pigment in the blood. The pigment in the blood is from the globulin. The baby may be slightly yellow, jaundiced due to the pigment. This occurs in the first two weeks of birth. When carbon burns in less oxygen, carbon monoxide is formed. And this occurs when charcoal is burnt in a poorly ventilated house. Hemoglobin has a higher affinity for carbon monoxide than oxygen. Hemoglobin will therefore combine with carbon two oxide or carbon monoxide to form carboxyhemoglobin. Carboxyhemoglobin does not dissociate and therefore reduces the capacity of blood to transport oxygen. And this leads to suffocation and subsequently to death. Transport of carbon dioxide. Hemoglobin in the red blood cells combine with carbon dioxide to form carbonohemoglobin, and most of the carbon dioxide is transported in this form from tissues to the lungs. Carbon dioxide is also transported as hydrogen carbonate. Carbon dioxide produced in the tissues is released in the bloodstream. This carbon dioxide enters the blood and combines with water to form carbonic acid. An enzyme called carbonic anhydrase found in the red blood cells speeds up the conversion of carbon dioxide to carbonic acid. The carbonic acid dissociates into bicarbonate and hydrogen ions. The bicarbonate ions diffuse out of the red blood cells into the plasma in which they are transported to the lungs. The excess hydrogen ions combine with hemoglobin to form hemoglobinic acid which acts as a buffer. A buffer is a solution that resists change in pH when an acid or an alkali is added to it. Some carbon dioxide is also transported in plasma in the form of carbonic acid.
Next, we look at the ABO blood grouping system. And Carl Steiner, through a series of experiments in the year 1900, discovered factors in the red blood cells and plasma that are responsible for blood grouping. Now, the factors in red blood cells are called antigens, while those in plasma are called antibodies or agglutinins. The ABO blood grouping system is based on the fact that red blood cells have either one, both or none of the antigens A or B on their membrane. It is also based on the fact that plasma has either one, both or none of the antibodies A and B. An individual with a specific antigen on the red blood cell membrane does not possess its corresponding antibody in the plasma. For example, a person of blood group A has antigen A on the membrane of red blood cells but has antibody B in the plasma. The presence of antigen A and its corresponding antibody A in the blood of an individual would lead to clumping of red blood cells and this is referred to as agglutination. It also means that a person with blood group B has antigen B on the membrane of the red blood cells and antibody A in the plasma. If both antigen A and B occur on the red blood cell membrane, the person then has no antibodies in the plasma and the blood group of such a person would be AB. In case both antibodies A and B are present in the plasma, then the red blood cell membrane will not have any antigen and the blood group of such a person is said to be O. Next is the rhesus factor. The red blood cells may also contain another antigen on their membrane known as the rhesus antigen. Individuals with the rhesus antigen on the membrane of erythrocytes are said to be rhesus positive, while individuals without the rhesus antigen are said to be rhesus negative. A rhesus negative blood will react against a transfusion with a rhesus positive blood. For example, when a racist negative woman marries a racist positive man, the woman is likely to conceive a racist positive fetus. The racist positive antigen of the fetus passes across the placenta in the mother's bloodstream during the last month of pregnancy, and the mother's body responds by producing racist antibodies which cross the placenta into the fetal circulation. The racist antibodies destroy some of the red blood cells of the fetus because they recognize them as foreign. The firstborn child has higher chances of survival because the destruction of the red blood cells is minimal. In subsequent pregnancies, however, massive destruction of red blood cells occur, leading to death of the fetus. And this condition is referred to as erythroblastosis fetalis, or commonly as hemolytic disease of the newborn, HDN. The mother can be treated with antiracous globulin which prevents her from producing antibodies against the fetal antigens and this will protect the red blood cells of the fetus in subsequent pregnancies. The baby is transfused with racist negative blood after birth due to the extensive breakdown of red blood cells. Now, during blood transfusion, when blood of a donor and recipient mix freely without agglutination, the blood from the two individuals is said to be compatible. The blood from two individuals is said to be incompatible if agglutination occurs when the two blood samples are mixed. Normally, it doesn't matter if the donor's antibodies are incompatible with the recipient's antigen, and this is due to the fact that the recipient receives a relatively small amount of blood from the donor, and the resulting dilution reduces agglutination of the red blood cells to an insignificant level. In addition, the red blood cells of a donor have a short lifespan and there is no permanent supply of antibodies from the donor. People with blood group O are referred to as universal donors. Why? Because they can donate blood to individuals of any four of the blood groups A, B, AB and O. However, an individual of blood group O can only receive blood from a donor of the same blood group. Why? Because with blood group O, it means there are no antigens, but there are both antibodies in the plasma of such a person. People with blood group A, B have both antigens A and B on the cell membrane of the red blood cells, and therefore they have no antibodies in their plasma. People with this blood group are said to be universal recipients because they can receive blood from any individual of all the four groups because they have no antibodies to react against any antigen introduced. An individual with blood group AB can only donate blood to a person of the blood group AB. Why? Because they contain both the antigens A and B. 
during blood transfusion blood compatibility based on the ab system and the resource factor are taken into consideration donors are usually chosen from healthy individuals who are between 18 and 65 years Donated blood is usually screened for many diseases such like HIV, tuberculosis, syphilis, and hepatitis B. Next, we look at immune responses. And immunity refers to the ability of an organism to identify foreign substances and develop mechanisms to remove or destroy foreign substances from the body. Now, immunity can be natural or artificial. Natural immunity is grouped into three, that is natural passive immunity, natural innate active immunity, and natural acquired active immunity. Natural passive immunity. Natural passive immunity is developed when antibodies from the mother cross the placenta into the fetal circulation. It is also passed to young babies from their mothers through colostrum by breastfeeding. Colostrum is the first milk produced by the mother after giving birth and this type of immunity is temporary and protects babies from measles in the first nine months after birth. The babies will develop their own immunity with time. Natural or innate active immunity and this is a type of natural immunity where the body develops a resistance to a disease after the first contact with the disease causing organism. This type of natural immunity is inborn and lasts for a long time. Natural acquired active immunity. Some people develop immunity after suffering from certain diseases such as malaria. For example, some people who live in malaria infected areas have developed resistance to the disease. The body manufactures antibodies and antitoxins during the sickness which enables them to recover naturally. This immunity can also be developed against yellow fever, mumps, and measles. Natural acquired active immunity lasts for a very long time. Next is artificial immunity. Artificial immunity is acquired through immunization. There are two types of artificial immunity that is active artificial immunity and passive artificial immunity. Active artificial immunity is developed by introducing a weakened dose of microorganism into a healthy person to stimulate the immune response to produce antibodies and antitoxins. The process of weakening the disease causing microorganism is known as attenuation. The weakened bacteria and viruses are given in the form of a vaccine. Vaccination is a deliberate introduction of a vaccine in the body and immunity acquired this way lasts long. In passive artificial immunity, in this type of immunity, antibodies are administered to the body when it cannot produce its own. And this is common during disease outbreaks. Immunization is provided in the form of an antiserum. An antiserum is a serum containing antibodies. This immunization is passive. Why? Because the body is not activated to produce its own antibodies. This type of immunity is administered in the case of tetanus and diphtheria. It is also administered against rabies and cholera. Immunity acquired this will last for a short time. Vaccination and a vaccine is a weakened or dead form of disease causing microorganisms. Vaccines are administered either orally or by infection. Vaccines are important in maintaining healthy individuals. Vaccination allows individuals to develop immune responses against infections that could become contagious or spread easily in case of epidemics. Immunization controls the rate at which diseases spread and through vaccination, the World Health Organization eliminated smallpox in the year 1977 from the face of the world. Extensive development has also been made in the field of immunization. It's now possible to use a combined vaccination against measles, mumps and rubella. Rubella is also referred to as German measles and in the last few years, a vaccine has been developed against diphtheria, whooping cough, tetanus, hepatitis B and hemophilus influenza. At the age of 4 years, children are given booster vaccines against polio and diphtheria. People of different ages are also vaccinated against yellow fever, cholera, hepatitis B, typhoid, meningitis and tetanus.
allergic reactions and an allergy is a hypersensitive reaction to an antigen by the body or simply we can say an allergy is an overreaction of the body to a harmful or a less harmful antigen now most of us have noticed some people who develop skin rashes after taking some food or medicine or even coming into contact with some plants foreign bodies such as pollen grains dust particles feathers fur certain foods and drugs cause allergic reactions these foreign bodies are called allergens. Allergic reactions may cause skin rashes, itching, sneezing, vomiting, coughing, and swelling of the body. The body reacts by overproducing antibodies against the allergens, which are acting as antigens, and the antigen-antibody reaction causes cells to release a chemical called histamine. Histamine causes inflammation, itching, and pain. Allergies may lead to diseases such as asthma and hay fever. Finally, we look at the defects or diseases that affect the circulatory system and we start with arteriosclerosis. Arteriosclerosis occurs when there is hardening of the arteries. The hardening is brought about by fat deposits on the walls of the arteries, fibrous tissues forming in artery walls or degeneration of the artery walls. The lumen of the artery narrows, hindering the flow of blood. The heart is therefore forced to pump blood harder and faster in order to supply enough blood to the tissues and this condition often leads to high blood pressure. Lifestyles of individuals contribute to this disease and arteriosclerosis can be prevented by exercising, avoiding alcohol and smoking, living a stress-free life and avoiding fatty food. It can be treated by taking medication that lower blood pressure. Another disease is called coronary thrombosis. Thrombosis is formation of blood clots in the blood vessel, and these clots are called thrombus. Coronary thrombosis refers to the clotting of blood in the coronary artery, denying the heart supply of blood and nutrients, and also removal of waste materials. And this often leads to a heart attack due to death of cells that are served by the blocked artery. Coronary arteries supply heart muscles with oxygen and nutrients. When a clot blocks blood from reaching the tissues of the heart, the tissues experience shortage of oxygen and nutrient supply. The symptoms include a sharp pain especially on the left side of the chain, difficulty in breathing and irregular heartbeat. In severe cases of heart attack, some cardiac cells die leading to heart failure and death. This disease can be prevented in the same way as the arteriosclerosis, but it can be treated by taking medication that prevent blood clot formation. Another important disease is called congenital heart defect. At birth, the blood circulatory system of the mother and the fetus become independent. The pulmonary artery takes very little blood to the lungs of the fetus because they are not used for gaseous exchange. Blood flows between the right and left auricle through an opening in the wall between two auricles. The opening is called foramen or veil before birth. The passage normally seals after birth. Now, in some cases, it may fail to seal. When it fails to seal, lungs are denied adequate blood and gaseous exchange is not efficient. Blood transports less oxygen and removes less carbon dioxide from the tissues and there is mixing of oxygenated and deoxygenated blood. The baby turns dark and may die and these conditions can only be repaired surgically. Another defect is caused when valves within the heart do not close adequately to prevent backflow of blood and this condition is said to be a mama of the heart. It is diagnosed by sounds of the heart as the valves close. The sounds last longer and are not definite and this condition can be corrected surgically again. Also, the connecting vessel between pulmonary artery and aorta, that is the ductus arteriosus, may not be sealed. The vessel normally seals at birth, blood flow to the lungs is cut off and enters the aorta. When the vessel fails to seal, blood flow to the lungs is inadequate and again, oxygenated and deoxygenated blood will make. Gaseous exchange is impaired and tissues lack oxygen. 
the baby may turn dark and this condition is also corrected surgically. Atherosclerosis is a chronic inflammatory response affecting the walls of the artery. Deposits of what we call plaque, which are made up of low-density lipoproteins and triglycerides, together with cells which migrate to the area, collect within the walls of the arteries and make the artery more hardened. This restricts the blood flow and limits the elasticity of the arterial vessels that supply various tissues of the body. At times, blood flow can be severely limited or completely blocked. Tissues that are served by these vessels don't receive enough oxygen then and may cease functioning or die. And in the heart, this is what we refer to as a heart attack. In the brain, 